。好，各位朋友，欢迎大家呢来进入到我们这个《精英家庭适度计划之生物医药》的这一个特别节目。我们今天呢，呃，主题就是领你走进美国私立生物医药这个研究所。那我们都知道呢，这个美国呢是世界上应该说非常强大的这个生物医药研究的这个。非常高超的这个非常高这个超级这个国家，那么今天呢，我们主要是来看看，就是它，呃，是私立而不是呃所谓的国立啊、呃，就是公立的这么一个研究所。那么今天呢，我们会呃介绍好几所，比如说啊、呃，如雷贯耳的这个霍华德休斯呃，这个医学研究所 HHMI， 以及呢这个呃冷泉港实验室，还有呢这个旧金山的 Gladstone 啊、呃、研究所。比如说，也有西雅西雅图的两所，比如说 Fred Hutchinson 癌症研究所和这个，呃 b e n a r o y a 研究所，研究这个自身免疫疾病的这个研究所，以及呢还有这个费城的 w i s t e r 研究所，啊，那么这些研究所呢，呃，都有一个共同特点，就是有这个非常著名的这些当时的这个，嗯。其实他并不一定，他本身自己并不一定就是做生物医药这个行业，但是呢，他比如说这个霍华德休斯的这个叫 Howard Hughes， 那他以前呢是这个呃航空啊，坐飞机，然后这个坐航空大飞机的，以及做拍电影啊啊，成为这个巨富。然后呢，他在去世之后呢，来投资成立了这个 H H M I。霍华德休斯医学研究所，那还有这个叫斯克里普斯这个研究所呢，是这个成立在这个加州啊啊，还有在佛罗里达州啊，他研究这个除了化学、生物医药啊，还研究海洋啊这个方面这个研究，这个一个很著名的一个研究所。那还有比如说这个 Fred Hutchinson 西雅图的这个研究所呢，他。实际上是这个哈钦森这个医学博士，他来纪念他的这个弟弟啊。这个弟弟他是一个，呃，这个棒球的这个选手，也也是一个经理。他因为这个疾病去世，所以呢，他这个用他的弟弟 Fred Hutchinson 的成立的命名的这个癌症研究所啊。当然也有这个欧洲的著名的家族拉德维希、路德维希啊，这个癌症研究所，他们呢在世界主要的这个。呃，著名的大学啊，都成立呃一些研究所，比如说哈佛啊、斯坦福啊、啊、呃、约翰霍普金斯啊，是吧？包括牛津啊等等啊，这些全世界都有很多这样的研究所。所以呢，我们今天呢，应该是呃借着这个主题呢，和大家简短的分享。我们会用啊、呃、图片啊、视频啊来给大家来介绍。那么首先呢，就呃带领大家呢进入到了霍华德休斯这个呃医学研究所。OK。好，正如刚才我们呃跟大家讲的，这个霍华德休斯呢研究所呢，它是呃美国一个非盈利性的这个医学呃研究所，由著名的飞行员、工程师霍华德休斯在一九五三年的时候成立的，呃，而且它是基本上是目前呃美国最大规模的一个私人资金啊、呃、资呃资助的一个生物和医学研究的一个组织了啊、呃。那么就是说，在一九五三年的时候呢。这个霍华德休斯呢，就是以他的名字创编创办了这个霍华德休斯医医学研究所。那么他的目的呢，就是要进行一个基础的研究啊，进行探讨生命的本源。呃，他的这个 HHMI 的一个宪章规定，霍华德休斯医学研究所啊，应、呃、促进人类的知识领域内的基础科学，主要是医学研究和医学教育领域和有效应用啊，这样呢，从而来造福这个人类。呃，在霍华德休斯呢，他今年的近几年的一些呃医医学研究成果呢，其中就包括这个细胞因子免疫疗法的一个突破。突破之一呢，就是颠覆传统的这个方法，呃，这个传统的比如说治标不治本的一些局面。所以采用这个 HHMI 细胞因子这个疗法呢，是活化后的这个呃这个 HHMI 这个细胞呢，可以合成和分泌多种这个细胞因子。从而这个发挥调节免疫以及直接杀伤，把细胞啊清除这个，比如说疱疹病毒啊等等。那还有这个在尖锐石油疱疹这个复发的呃解决这个难题。另外呢，它也解决这个传统治疗的一些呃关于这个
可能会有一些这个复发呀，是吧？那么它这种细胞因子的疗法呢，可以治疗一个疗程之后，可以控制这个病情。那突破这个四呢，就是它解决这个传统。呃，治疗机理，比如说不明确的这个这个问题，因为本身做这个基础研究嘛，所以就是呃，这个四个大的方面呢，就是这个霍华德修斯呃医学研究所在细胞因子免疫疗法的最近的四大突破。其实呢，霍华德修斯对于我们中国来说，培养了一个最最著名的人，那就是现在的北京生物研究所的所长啊，王晓东院士啊。那么呢，这个王王晓东院士呢，有的牵头呢，在呃，中国呢，呃，成了这个，呃，也成立了，是吧？这个所谓的那个叫什么呀？百济神州这个药药，呃，这个制药公司是吧？所以呢，也推出了非常多的这个生物制品，挽救了啊、呃、很非常多的病人啊。那么呢，对于这个霍华德修斯的一个解药的介绍，你看我们现在看到的这个图片呢，大家可以看到这个图片上。可以看到，就是说霍华德修斯的，他是在美国的马里兰的这个叫所谓的叫 Chase Harvey Harvey Chase 这个地方呢，呃，一刚刚新成呃，或者是最近几年刚新成立的这么一个应该是 complex 研究这个体验非常的呃，应该说漂亮，设计很有艺术感，流线型。那么呢，呃，我们后面呢不妨呢，我们现在呢不妨呢，比如说来给大家播放一个视频，然后来。通过视频呢，来深入的了解这个更深入的 HHMI 这个了解啊，这个它的一个情况，请大家稍等。As humans, we have this innate desire to understand the world around us, and the only way we can do that is by studying it. Being the only species capable of carrying out the scientific research, we really are a way for life to understand itself. Research is a funny beast. Essentially, you follow your nose with different questions, and we're hoping that those questions lead to answers that have the potential for enormous impact. Scientific research is incredibly expensive. People who are constrained by funding have to place short-term bets and do safe science. The whole point is to discover something that you didn't know before. And so, if you're locked into a programmatic plan for research, you're really forced to learn the things that we already know. But with freedom and flexibility, you can dive off in entirely unexpected areas of research. For over 30 years, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute has been funding basic biomedical research. The HHMI Investigator Program is a program that supports scientists across the country who want to discover new frontiers. Our model provides scientists with much more freedom. It's different from every other model because they fund people, not projects. I think the coolest thing about being an HHMI investigator is that you can pursue your vision without constraints. You have ultimately the freedom to pursue your most important ideas. The support comes with essentially no strings attached. It gives you an opportunity to really try to accomplish great things. When you become an investigator, you join a community of excellent scientists. HHMI goes far beyond funding. A highlight of the year is that we're able to go to science meetings, which bring together many different components of the HHMI families. You see this remarkable parade of scientific discovery. It really is absolutely priceless. You're surrounded by scientists who are exploring an incredible diversity of topics. You come back having new ideas for your own science. Diversity of thought, diversity of experience, diversity of culture. Everybody has something important to bring to the table. If you want to apply to be a Hughes investigator, we're holding a national competition. We encourage scientists from around the country to apply. Becoming an HHMI investigator is a really tremendous opportunity to do something new. If you're really committed to really understanding the underpinnings of life, why wouldn't you want to throw your hat in the ring? It will really allow you to do the science that you always dreamed you wanted to do. Okay.
，那这是我们今天介绍这个第一个呃医学研究所。那么下面呢，我要给大家介绍第二个这个医学研究所呢，就是呃 the the Scripps Research Institute。那么这个 Scripps Scripps 这个研究所呢，它实际上是呃。开始于这个叫一个叫代谢诊所啊，这是在这个加州啊，圣地亚哥。那么在一九二四年的时候呢，有这个慈善家 a l a n Brownie Scripps 呢，就是在圣地亚哥这个呃拉霍亚地区呢来建立。那他主要是当时受到了一个胰岛素的这个启发。那么后面的话呢，呃，他又建了，比如说对化学呀、啊、海洋学呀、啊。这个相关的研究，那么所以呢，就是这是一个综合性的研究所啊，不仅仅是研究这个，比如说生物啊，或者是癌症啊，那它在化学、免疫啊、生物啊以及海洋啊这个方面都有这个研究。呃，那么这个研究所呢，主要就是在一九五九年的时候呢，有一个哈佛大学这个生物化学家呢，叫 A. b e a r h a s t i n g 呢，一九一九五九年加入之后的话。那么，一九六一年呢，又有这个免疫学家啊，叫 Frank Dixon， 以及同事呢 William Wig 啊 j o h n s o n f e d m a n 等等啊，加入之后呢，那么就啊，使得这个研究所呢名声鹊起，取得了一系列的这个突破，对吧？呃，这个目前呢，他的董事会的主席呢是这个 John 啊 Dickman， 对吧？那么，呃，这些我们看看，这是他的一些这个。简要的这个图片是吧？呃，关于这个研究所呢，我觉得最好呢还是啊、呃，用我们这个这个视频的方式给大家直接呈现啊，要比我讲的更加具体。大家看视频。Neurodegenerative diseases are based on protein misfolding and misassembly, and we're trying to understand the details of that process so we can fashion small molecules to、um, slow it down or stop it, and therefore stop the progression of the neurodegenerative disorder. The scientific and medical communities have been pretty pessimistic regarding. Whether protein aggregation is the driver for neurodegenerative diseases, despite really strong genetic evidence. So what we've done here, which is really important, is to show that using a drug, we can stop aggregation and therefore stop or slow the progression of a neurodegenerative disease. So the notion of using small molecules to stabilize proteins that are Problematic because they're unstable and they aggregate, or they're unstable and they get degraded. That notion originated with some of Jeff's work in the mid '90s. I came along around 1999, 2000, and、uh, developed a small molecule that I thought would bind to transthyretin,、uh, which later became known as tafamidus. It was based on a structure that I knew from my work in graduate school would be easy to synthesize. We did the basic testing, and it turned out to look promising, and it got developed from there. We came up with the concept that if you could stabilize transthyretin by a small molecule, then it would stabilize the protein in a shape that won't allow it to aggregate. We had to make a lot of small molecules in order to find the special one. After making a thousand or so. We came up with the drug that we now call Tafamidus, which is a potent and safe、um, small molecule stabilizer of transthyretin, and thus prevents the degenerative diseases associated with its aggregation. Well, until development of Tafamidus, there were no drugs. The therapy involved was liver transplant in people who had mutations, which was a pretty aggressive form of gene therapy. Now、uh, I think it's possible for people to take an oral medicine that appears to arrest the progression of the disease if administered early enough in the course of the disease. I'm working on the way to famidus, which is a small molecule that binds transthyretin. I'm working on similar lines to find some new small molecules that can bind to light chains. If we are potentially successful, then that will be a new drug for a number of people who get affected by this protein as they grow older.
this is a major discovery because of the number of people that can benefit from it. It's not only the people in the transthyretin amyloidoses, there's also uh, people with other kinds of diseases that can be addressed in a similar way. The potential impact of this drug, the number of lives that it could impact could be uh, up to a million, uh, we don't know. For me personally, being part of Scripps research, it is very exciting because we are hunting for, for you know, novel therapies that might one day impact people who suffer from a range of diseases. While we're incredibly enthusiastic about the drug we created, the limitation is that it only works for ameliorating the transthyretin amyloid diseases. There are 40 other proteins whose aggregation causes different neurodegenerative disorders. So what we're doing now is to fashion drugs that hasten disassembly and clearance of aggregates so as to be generally useful for most, if not all, neurodegenerative diseases.好这个视频结束呢其实就把这个就把这个就把这个就把这个就把这个就把这个就把这个就把这个就把这个就把这个就把这个就把这个就把这个就把这个就把这个就把这个就把这个就把这个就把这个就把这个就把这个就把这个就
Basic research is the key to understanding and solving mankind's most difficult problems. My name is George Ancopoulos. I'm a member of Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories Board of Trustees and am the co-founder, president, and chief scientific officer at Regeneron Pharmaceuticals, one of the world's leading biotech companies. I grew up scientifically at Cold Spring Harbor working with my mentor, Fred Alt, to teach the laboratory's cloning course in the 1980s. I have many fond memories from instructing courses and being part of the culture of scientific exchange that defines Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. I'm a great believer in Cold Spring Harbor, not only for what it achieves on the research and academic stage, but also what it contributes to the international scientific community. Through the leadership of Bruce Dillman, the laboratory has grown and is recognized as one of the world's top institutions in life sciences. The meetings and courses division here at Cold Spring Harbor and at Cold Spring Harbor Asia annually convene 12,000 of the world's best scientific minds in an environment that encourages communication and collaboration. Through this program, the lab has trained a number of Nobel laureates as young scientists and has been at the forefront of numerous breakthroughs in life sciences, most notably its contribution to the Human Genome Project, driven by the initiative of James Watson. Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory is now extending this international impact through BioArchives, a unique online preprint service. With the support and collaboration with the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, BioArchive enables scientists to share drafts of papers pre-publication, accelerating the pace of communication and research. The laboratory's central mission is to expand the footprint of cutting edge research and to enhance scientific knowledge worldwide. Dr. Adrian Craner's work has led to the development of the first ever treatment for spinal muscular atrophy, the leading genetic cause of infant mortality. He is applying a similar approach towards cystic fibrosis and muscular dystrophy. The success of this therapy is demonstrative of the power of the laboratory's translational potential. The work of Dr. Michael Wiggler, studying the genetic signatures of autism, is preparing to enter the clinic and make a difference in the lives of children with autism and their families. Dr. Anthony Zador is applying his groundbreaking technology for precisely mapping connections of every neuron in the brain with the aim of discovering new drug targets for neurological disorders from depression to schizophrenia. The breakthroughs being made in the field of cancer research by Drs. David Tuvison, David Spector, Nicola Egobod, Nick Tonks, and Camilo Dos Santos have resulted in a number of new therapies advancing towards the clinic. The discoveries taking place at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory are being recognized through prestigious honors, including Dr. Limor Joshua Tor, who was recently elected to the National Academy of Sciences and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. From training the scientific leaders of tomorrow to leading the charge in solving major cancers and unraveling the genetics of autism, we discover, we educate, and we impact human lives. Basic research is fundamental to understanding life as we know it. Join us as we push the boundaries of what is known to better our lives for the future. Okay, this Lenquan Gang experience is with China. In Suzhou, there is a collaboration. 呃，如果是后面疫情呃没有离开的话，那么应该会有很多的会议啊，会在中国这个苏州举行啊。那么下面呢，我们就因为时间关系呢，我们就进入到下一个这个实验室啊，是在这个叫美国西雅图的这个 Fred Hutchinson 这个癌症研究所。那么这个研究所呢，呃，它是挺有意思的，它是什么呢？它是这个。创始人的弟弟哈金森弟弟呢，叫 Fred Fred Hutchinson。他四十五岁的时候呢，就死于肺癌了。而 Fred Hutchinson 呢，他以前是这个美国棒球大联盟的投手和经理啊，也是一个非常著名的一个呃棒球运动员。那么呢，这个他去世之后呢，所以他的哥哥呢，叫呃就就成立了这个以他弟弟命名的 Fred Hutchinson 命名的这个癌症研究所。他是啊、呃，作为美国这个太平洋西北这个研究。呃，应该说基金会的一个一个部门，对吧？那么其实呢，在应该是二零啊一六一七年的样子的时候呢，这个中国的国家主席访问美国的时候，那么这个中国的第一夫人这个彭丽媛呢，其实
到达西雅图的时候，专门的，呃，这个参访了 Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Institute 啊，所以这个研究所呢是在美国的西雅图。那么我们知道，美国西雅图呢是有一个 University of Washington 啊，华盛顿大学所在地，它的 University of Washington Medicine 呢也是啊非常啊，在美国的西北地区呢，呃，主教非常有名啊。而且呢，在西雅图，我们知道这个星巴克呀，是吧？这个波音啊的总部呢，还有 Microsoft 和微微软啊，是吧？都是在这个啊、呃、西雅图，是吧？所以这个 Fred Hutchinson 的这个呃基金会呢，它主要是除了治疗致力于这个癌症研究啊，也致力于心脏的手术啊，以及这个内分泌系统的这个研究啊，嗯、呃，在这个就是说。西雅图呢，它创立了这个，其实算是一个 National Cancer Institute， 它算是美国癌症研究所的其中的指定的癌症中心之一，是吧？呃，那么这个一九九八年的时候呢，就是说它成立了这个西雅图癌症护理联盟，啊、呃，就是是一家非盈利的这个一个公司，而且与这个呃 University of Washington 啊、呃、UW Medicine 和西雅图儿童医院啊、呃、这个合作，是吧？这样的话呢，就是研究和临床。就更好的一个结合，是吧？那到目前呢，这个就是说，二零一四年的时候，就这个中心的这个所谓的执行总裁啊，就是这位叫所谓的 Gary g i l l a n d 是吧？成为这个总裁及首席执行官，是吧？那么这个叫 Fred Hutchinson 啊，是美国西北地区啊非常呃著名的这么一个癌症研究所。那么我们下面呢，也是通过一个，呃，这个视频啊，来帮大家来进行来梳理一下这个，弗雷德哈金森研究所。我们通过二零二一年的他的年报 Annual Report 来来研究来学习。2021 was a remarkable year. We accomplished so much. Probably the most important is we began to discuss how we could rework the relationship between the Fred Hutch Cancer Research Center, the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, Children's Hospital, and UW Medicine to create the new Fred Hutch Cancer Center. The establishment of the Fred Hutch Cancer Center will allow us to bring our science closer to our patients. And when you really think about 2021, one of the things that we can look upon as being a really terrific accomplishment was how our virologists in vid, both here at the Hutch and at the University of Washington, made contributions to understanding the pandemic, the discovery of vaccines, the, the role that our co-VPN played in vaccine development brought Hutch science to patients. And in that same vein, I think about the opening of the Clinical Research Center for viruses that opened under Rachel Bender Nasio's leadership. And in 2021, how that facility began to do trials in patients who had COVID. And I think in 2022 and 2023, you're gonna see the broad impact across our entire society of work that started here. We've always done this. If you think about bone marrow transplant and cellular immunotherapies, treatments that have been pioneered at the Fred Hutch, that really was the best example of translating Hutch science to patients. And now with the establishment of the Fred Hutch Cancer Center, we have the opportunity to do the same thing for patients with solid tumors, to do it for patients who have lung cancer and colon cancer and Merkel cell tumors, and melanomas, and pancreatic cancer, and head and neck cancer, in addition to the strong areas that we've worked on in the past. When I think about 2021, I realize that we have set in motion the ingredients to create a truly unique place to accelerate cancer research. And that's what the Fred Hutch Cancer Center will be. The blueprint of our future includes doors that are open to people who are previously locked out.
There are so many things that the Fred Hutch can look to and feel gratitude and pride in our ability to accomplish. One of the things I'm most excited about is we brought new scientists to the Fred Hutch Cancer Research Center, including eight who've come to the Hutch or identified through our unique cluster hire, which brought scientists from groups that traditionally haven't been represented in our faculty, all bring energy and enthusiasm and insight and innovation to the way they look at scientific problems. Remember, these recruitments were all accomplished in a time when traveling was difficult, when giving live seminars was extremely hard to do. Most of the job talks were given over Zoom. Another big example of progress was we saw the steam plant come into its own and, and fill with scientists. Many of the scientists in the steam plant are people who are working in other parts of the hutch, but we brought new people to the steam plant as well. And when I go to the steam plant, I am energized because I see computational biologists working right next to our experimental scientists. And that connection is really remarkable. Our science is the foundation of everything we do across the board, not just in cancer, not just in virology. When I think of the work of Akanchka Singhvi, her work on glial pruning that might give us insights into how the nervous system reforms and grows and evolves. It might give us insights into neurologic disease. And what Akanchka's work shows is how critical fundamental basic science is to the Fred Hodge and the contribution that the basic science division makes to our understanding of human biology and of human disease. I also think of the work of our graduate students, Ali Greeny from the Bloom Lab and Megan Garrett from the Overball Lab, for example, of two graduate students who made remarkable contributions to our understanding of COVID. And that connection between the graduate student, the postdoc, the PI, something which has defined the way science has been done at the Fred Hutch, is something, again, that is remarkable to see every year. A key pillar of the foundation of the Fred Hodge is our commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Because if you think about two of the three largest causes of death in the United States are cancer and COVID, both disproportionately affect Black Americans, Hispanic Americans, and uh, Native Americans in terms of outcomes. And if we're committed to eliminating suffering from cancer and viral diseases, we've got to understand why this differential exists. I also think it's important that we work to achieve greater diversity of our staff and our faculty. Over the next year, we've got to look at and think about how do we reflect the diversity of our community in the people who work at the Front Hutch and our leadership teams. How do we work to develop or promote leaders that are as diverse as our workforce, who are as diverse as our community. I think finally, it's important to think that diversity, equity, and inclusion also talks about the way we work together and the way we live together and the values that we hold important to us. And I wanna thank Paul Buckley's team and Chris Lee for the remarkable work they've done to make DEI front and center in the mission of the Fred Hutch. Philanthropic support is the mortar that fastens our cutting edge research to improving cancer patients' lives. Many of you know that grants from the National Cancer Institute and other parts of the NIH support about 70% of the science that we do. And that means 30% is supported by people who give to our mission. When I think about the opening this year of our cryo-EM shared resource and the recruitment of Melody Campbell, yeah, that never would have happened without the generosity of people who see how critical our mission is. I can't tell you how challenging it is for me to walk around the campus and see empty hallways. I love to walk into the cafeteria and hear the buzz of people sitting, eating together, laughing, talking about their work. I can't wait to be able to bring more and more people to the Fred Hutch. They need to see what's happening in the Arnold Building. They need to see what's happening in the steam plant. They need to go to the new building 
and see how we have the chance to build the future together to make an enormous difference for people and for families. Okay, this Fred Hutchinson's this video is very interesting. Uh, very eye-catching. Ah, this is very interesting. Now, we next come to the next research institute called Ludwig Center. Ah, Ludwig Center. This research institute is not just one research institute. It is in the United States. For example, at Harvard, at MIT. 在巴尔的摩的约翰霍普金斯，在斯坦福，在芝加哥，在路易斯安那，在纽约，在呃这个牛津、Oxford 以及在圣地亚哥呢，都有这个所谓的路德维希啊 Center 啊路德维希的研究呃中心。那么这个路德维希癌症研究所呢，是由慈善家 Daniel K. 路德维希呢，在一九七一年的时候呢，创立的一个国际的非营利组织。总部呢在纽约，而且在苏伊士和呃一设有这个欧洲的这个办公办公处啊办事处。那这个创始人这个洛德维希呢是航运巨头和房地房地产的投资者。他呢一八九七年出生在密西根州的南黑温市，呃，就是说从父亲那里获得五千美元的这个贷款之后呢。就成立了，建立一个以超级游轮啊为基础的这个全球的商业帝国。所以到二零二世纪六七十年的时候呢，这个路德维希就是世界上最富有的人之一了。所以拥有一个有全球呃两百家公司的一个一个商业帝国。所以呢，这个呃路德维希研究所呢是提供了他所持有所有的，就是说他外国的这些资产之后呢，一九九二年去世之后，他把这个。呃，捐赠的七亿多美元呢，就成立这个这个路德维希这个研究所啊，就把这个投入到这个研究所这个建设当中啊。所以这个研究所呢是非常，主要是侧重于这个免疫治疗啊，以及呢这个细胞信号的这个发现，以及呢还有基因组学，对吧？那么这个路德维希的呃，在牛津的啊。其中有一个应应该是来自于我们中国啊香港的啊这么一个科学家叫 Carol Liang 啊，所以呢也加入这个团队，以及呢有来自于中国这个呃应该是北京的一个叫陆星啊啊也也是参与到这个在牛津大学的这个研究啊呃、啊、应该说还有这个像路德维希研究所的话呢，还有气焰啊。当啊，这些都是属于我们的华人的这个啊和这个面孔。那么呢，我们呃对于这个路德维希研究所呢，呃不妨呢还是啊、呃、用这个视频呢来给大家来进一步的来讲解。那么这个呢是斯坦福的这个 key projects that we're carrying out here under the funding by the Ludwig have been to bring together world experts on stem cells and cancer stem cells, and finding from the purified cancer stem cells what are previously undiscovered targets. My research is uh, at the interface between normal development and uh, how cancer arises. And it is with the support uh, from an organization like the Ludwig that we are able to purchase equipment or to employ people in the lab, and very importantly also to support students and postdocs in the lab. That will indeed facilitate getting the results in the research that we, that we need. Well, we have a number of projects that we currently focus on with Ludwig's support. They generally relate to the development of therapeutic antibodies that target leukemia stem cells in AML, that's acute myeloid leukemia. The prime project uh, is a project where we are working to target CD47, which is a very important molecule that we discovered here at Stanford in our Ludwig Center several years back. Uh, and with support both from Ludwig and from CIRM, uh, we've been developing a humanized antibody for clinical trials in patients. 
We have a number of other secondary candidates for therapeutic antibodies that we've been working on uh, in parallel. They're not as far along in development, and we don't have external funding for those pro projects at this time. Uh, so the Ludwig has been critical to supporting uh, those therapeutic programs. Our own group has found that every cancer puts a don't eat me signal on its surface. Everyone, we discovered it through cancer stem cells and largely through the funding by the Ludwig, we found it is in every human cancer we tested that when we block the don't eat me signal, the cancers, the authentic human primary cancers, when transplanted into the bodies of immune deficient mice, brain cancer to brain, breast cancer to breast, that the tumors are largely or completely resolved. The Ludwig has allowed us to take a bold step to try to change from small molecule therapeutics, at least in our laboratory, to look for the immune modalities, which really promise to have higher and higher frequencies of cures. You have the basic discovery, the scientific observation, and then to translate that into an actual therapeutic. That big chasm, this valley, is one where there isn't and there are not very many funding sources available to support that type of research. So without Ludwig funding support, we might not be able to bring these projects forward, certainly not as quickly as we hope to, but maybe not at all, depending on how successful we were at, uh, at obtaining other sources of funding. The Ludwig, unlike most federal grants, bets on the person, not the project. And by gathering together the best immunologists and cancer specialists in the world and allowing them to have their own institution, play a key role, and as we uniquely do at Stanford, for the cancer stem cell side, and then interact between great groups, they know that the bet that they're making is likely to work because the track record of the people is already out there. As a physician, I experienced uh, suffering and mortality of my many patients that have these diseases. It's very motivating to go to the clinic and be in a scenario where you want to provide help and benefit, but you're not able to because the drugs just don't exist. Anytime I think about those clinical experiences, it's incredibly motivating. Now that has to translate then into an action and our action is to pursue this line of research. And that's really uh, where we need support from outstanding donors like the Ludwig Foundation. How我们可以看到就是说这个 呃，非常认可，信任这个科学家啊，这是一个非常好的这么一个项目，所以他是在应该说世界呃顶尖的这个生物医药研究所啊，本身他也也是大学里面的这个支持这个科学家，所以他的这个营运模式呢和其他的
，是当时的这个叫弗吉尼亚梅森这个研究中心。那么1985年的时候呢，就是说在这个 Gerald n a p o m 这个医学博士的呃这个倡导下呢，就成立这个现在的这个叫主要自身免疫这个研究项目。然后后面呢，在1999年的时候呢，搬进了这个呃西雅图的第一山这个附近的这个 Seneca 第九大道转弯处的这么一个新的建筑，所以就命名为。b e n a r o y a 这个研究所，它是为了纪念这个 b e n a r o y a 这个家族的捐款啊，啊是的捐款来来成立这么一个研究所的。OK， 那、啊、这是在 b e n a r o y a Research Institute at Virginia Mason 它的外面的这个拍的这个照片啊，呃，就是说它主要是在叫 Leaders in Autoimmune 啊 Diseases Research 啊，这个自身免疫性疾病。啊，比如说克罗恩病啊，还有这个 lupus， 就是系统性红斑狼疮啊，对吧？其实这个是是对于，尤其像系统性红斑狼疮，对于女性，呃，是一个真的挺糟糕的啊，这么一个疾病啊。那么呢，我们下面呢，也还是来采用呃一个一个视频来给大家来深入的的了解这个贝纳罗亚研究所。One in every twenty Americans suffers from an autoimmune disease, type one diabetes. Multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, and Crohn's disease, to name a few. Because many causes of autoimmune diseases are shared, people with an autoimmune disease are more likely to suffer from more than one. At Benaroya Research Institute at Virginia Mason, scientists aren't focused on eliminating one or two autoimmune diseases. They're collaborating to take on all 80, sharing research to find the common links that lead to the diseases, so even one breakthrough has a much larger impact. And BRI's discoveries are having an impact on people living with autoimmune diseases today, like me. I was diagnosed with MS in 2003.、Uh, that was three months after my mom was diagnosed.、And、my husband also has MS, as does his sister. So to say that we are living with MS in my family is a bit of an understatement. I was really frustrated before the clinical trial.、Uh, I had tried a couple different injectable medications and. I was having side effects that were not okay with me, and I was kind of at a loss as to what to do. I am so happy to be a part of this trial. It's a it's a good fit me being at BRI. They're helping me, and you know, I guess I'm helping them too. Molly Joe joined the repository here at BRI, which provides samples for scientific study from patients. Here at BRI, we're all about discovering causes and cures of autoimmune diseases. That means really understanding how the immune system works and applying that knowledge to prevent, to treat, and to eliminate these diseases. Obviously, when people already have a disease, it would be nice if we could cure the disease. But the ultimate cure is to prevent the disease. If we do find people who have two or more antibodies, unfortunately, that means that they will develop type one diabetes, and that means we want to give them the opportunity to be in a clinical trial. See if we can test a new therapy to delay or prevent the onset of type one diabetes. Being a scientist and a physician is 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 pretty exciting for me as an individual. And the way we've treated those diseases in the past is to just attack the immune system and stop it from working. Obviously, that's bad because we need our immune systems. So now, what we've begun to understand is that there are pathways within the immune system that lead to disease, and so we target those immune pathways very specifically. The way I feel about my work at BRI is I'm enthusiastic, and and I think people who meet me realize that my goal is to have the patients be enthusiastic about helping us with the research because it gives them hope, and the scientists have that enthusiasm that keeps them coming to work every day. Well, the ultimate goal is to basically eliminate disease, autoimmune disease. So the way we do research at BRI is fairly unique within the, the scientific community in that we have basic researchers like myself interacting with with doctors who who see patients all the time. At our place, there's a complete integrated approach to how we do our science, where we go from basically bench to bedside, back to bench, and we integrate them in in ways that no one else does. It's because of the common links between these autoimmune diseases that we formed the research programs at BRI, all built and designed around attacking the fundamental questions that link them all. 
We're where we are today because of the past research. And if I can help those living with autoimmune diseases, I'm happy to do what I can because we're all in this together. And, and so are we.好，我这个我觉得这个 美国旧金山的一个叫Gladstone啊，Institutes啊，这个研究所呢，它是呃一个独立的一个非营利性的一个生物医学这个研究机构，就是说重点呢主要是了解预防、治疗和治疗呃这个心血管的疾病啊，所
Head over to hello.gladstone.org and personalize your profile to get started and to connect with your community. Whether it's in the lab or at an interest group, start your Hello Gladstone experience and see what we can discover together. Hello Gladstone, what will you do today? OK， 这个呢，这个片子比较，我觉得比较 commercial 一点。那么可能专业度呢不够。我们下面看看有一个专业度比较高的这个视频。Hello, 嗯，这是一Today, I'm going to talk about our favorite gene, NOT1. This is RA Appreciation Week. We just wanted to give a huge thank you to all the RAs here at Gladstone. It is important to be out in science because we claim our space when we do that. We've had vaccines around for quite a while. COPD, as we know, is currently a form of cerebral lung disease that causes airway issues, such as in the same community. Welcome to Amplify Risk Reality in STEM series, as hosted by the Glasgow Institute. What I want to do today is uh, spend a little time with you 
on the taking stock, as I said, of where we are right now, and also think about the future. Walks coming up. Now, what's the length, typical length, uh, of a of a chalk talk? This is a highly prized honor that goes actually to very few. Thank you very much. Okay, 那这个加州旧金山的这个 Gladstone 呢，这个结束之后呢，我们就进入到下一个这个这个研究所，这叫做 Wister Institute。这个 Wister 研究所呢，它位于这个美国的费城啊 ，Philadelphia 啊，这个是一家独立的这个非盈利性的一个研究机构，主要是在肿瘤学、免疫学、传染病和疫苗研究方面啊，荣誉卓著。啊，它呢也是位于这个费城的大学城区，是吧？我们知道费城的话，最著名的大学就是 University of Pennsylvania U Penn， 是吧？常春藤啊，常春藤的名校。那么其实我也有朋友呢，就在这个常春藤名校 U Penn 呢做这个癌症的研究啊。我上次和他提到啊 ，Wister In Institute 研究所的时候，他说就在我们隔隔壁啊，对吧？所以这个就是说就就非常熟悉，对吧？这个 Wister 研究所呢。它是成立于一八九二年啊，是一个非常早的这个研究所了，应该说是美国第一家专注于生物医学研究和培训的这个非盈利的这个机构。那么，它在一九七二年的时候呢，呃，是美国国家这个癌症研究所指定的这个癌症中心。它的这个从这个二零一三年到一八年的话呢，连续几年的都获得这个癌症中心研究这个补助申请这个资金，而且它在疫苗开发上面呢。是世界范围内都非常的著名的，他这个研究所，呃的，比如说他的成就包括这个风疹，也就是说德国麻疹的疫苗、轮状病毒，还有狂犬病疫苗的创造，呃，这个做出了一些贡献啊。应该说这个研究所呢，应该是非常的这个名誉卓著啊啊。OK， 那这个呢是他的呃，威斯泰研究所的外面的这个外观啊，这个研究所的外观。那 OK。这个说多了不如这个视频是吧？所以呢，还是我们需要下面来进入到这个他的视频的这个播放。The nation's first independent biomedical research institute, established in 1892, now a community of scientists dedicated to solving the most challenging problems in cancer, infectious diseases, and vaccine research, with a proven history of scientific discoveries that has saved millions of lives around the world. Wistar's singular focus on innovative research has yielded incredible advances. And continues a tradition of collaboration and discovery across generations of scientists, with state-of-the-art facilities for cutting-edge research and a legacy of training the next generation of scientists. The future looks brighter than ever. 
at the forefront of biomedical research and bringing the future of medicine closer to reality. Science at the highest level. This is wisdom. Ah, we're going to enter the next one. 最后一个研究所叫丹纳法伯癌症研究所。那么这个呢是被认为是美国三大癌症研究所或者癌症医院最著名的之一了啊。我们知道，在美国三大呃这个第一名呢是托马斯这个德州的休斯顿的 MD 安德森癌症中心，第二呢是呃所谓的纪念凯瑟琳斯隆医院的这个在纽约啊纽约纪念凯瑟琳斯隆医院。那么第三位呢就是。丹纳法伯癌症研究中心啊，那么这个研究所呢，它也是美国啊，隶属于美国哈佛大学啊。那么知道在波士顿的话呢，那它的这个研究应该堪称美国是独天得天独厚了。那么这个丹纳法伯研究所呢，是我们呃最近的这个大家都知道的一些这个，比如说 CAR-T 的治疗啊，是吧？这个还有很多这个最先进的这些治疗方法呢，都是首先是在丹纳法伯这个啊研究所以及它的附属医院呢。呃，这个开始的，因为本身在波士顿的话呢，有除了麻省总医院是吧，还有波士顿儿童医院是吧，呃，以及包括这个一些的研究所 ，MIT 的研究所等等，那么这个这个是实力是非常强的，应该说是世界公认的呃最强的地方了。那么我们不妨呢，下面呢这个也是呢快速的进入到了一个叫 tour 啊 of the d e n a f a b 那是这个视频呢是我们最后一个视频。那么，在这个视频播放结束之后呢，我们就结束我们今天的这个啊、呃，带引你啊走进这个美国啊私立生物医药研究所的这个系列活动。那也感谢你的积极参与。好，下面我们这个最后一个视频 ，A virtual tour of Dana f a b Cancer Institute. Virtual tour. Hello, and welcome to Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, a world leader in cancer research and treatment. As a Harvard Medical School teaching hospital, our faculty includes the world's best and brightest physicians and researchers. Our unique approach features equal parts clinical and research work, where breakthrough medicines and treatments are brought from bench to bedside and bedside back to bench. And we partner with two of the world's top-ranked hospitals, Brigham and Women's and Boston Children's, and that provides complete and integrated care for our adult and our pediatric patients. Dana-Farber researchers have contributed to the development of 35 of 75 cancer drugs recently approved by the FDA for use in cancer patients, and we are consistently ranked by U.S. News and World Report as the number one cancer hospital in New England today. The institute employs more than 5,000 staff, faculty, and clinicians that support more than 640,000 annual outpatient visits, more than a thousand hospital discharges per year, and has over 1,100 open clinical trials. So, no matter what your role is, you are joining a culture of excellence and creativity, and we look forward so much to having you on our team. Today we are going to take you on a virtual tour of some of the most interesting and frequently visited sites on the Longwood campus. Let's start outside the Smith Research Building at this statue of our founder, Dr. Sidney Farber, the famous Jimmy. In 1948, just one year after Dr. Farber founded the Children's Cancer Research Foundation, a young patient of his named Einar Gustafsson was selected to speak on a national radio program. Tooth the Consequences, which was broadcast from his room at Boston Children's Hospital, dubbed Jimmy by Dr. Farber to protect his privacy. Ainer wished for a television set to watch his favorite baseball team, the Boston Braves, while in treatment. During the radio broadcast, Braves players crowded into Jimmy's hospital room with gifts, including the authentic team uniform you see him wearing here. The show ended with a plea for listeners to send contributions so Jimmy could get his TV set. Within minutes of the broadcast ending, people who listened on their car radios arrived at the hospital with money for Jimmy. In the days to come, thousands of envelopes stuffed with coins and dollar bills came by mail. Not only did Jimmy get his television, but more than two hundred thousand dollars was raised for research and treatment at Dr. Farber's center, and the Jimmy Fund was born. Now let's go into the Dana Building. The Dana Building originally housed several floors of clinics dedicated primarily to adult outpatient care 
and operations until the Yaki Center for Cancer Care was dedicated in 2011. Today, with the exception of the Jimmy Fund Clinic on the third floor, Dana is devoted to administrative and research endeavors. For decades, Dana-Farber investigators have turned to zebrafish as a powerful research model. The genes of this tiny tropical fish are remarkably like those of humans, allowing them to play a key role in the discovery of life-saving therapies. Dana-Farber's dynamic zebrafish display features 477 personal inscriptions honoring patients, caregivers, and loved ones. These notes of hope and appreciation are from generous donors whose gifts are helping to advance innovative research and in compassionate care at Dana-Farber. The cashier's booth next to the zebrafish display is where you will go to pick up your MBTA pass or get petty cash payments. Remember that they close for lunchtime, so you'll have to time your visits accordingly. Need a quick pick-me-up? Four or five coffee roasters has coffee, tea, baked goods, and lighter food options. Let's take the patient elevators to the third floor. Visitors to the third floor of the Dana building are greeted by this statue of Wally the Green Monster. Wally is the official mascot for the Boston Red Sox. His name comes from the Green Monster, the famous left field wall at Fenway Park. Wally sits just outside the Jimmy Fund Clinic in tribute to the Red Sox long commitment to our pediatric patients. The Jimmy Fund Clinic is one of the world's premier cancer centers for pediatric cancer treatment and research. It encourages hope for children with cancer and their families. Designed especially for the comfort and convenience of pediatric cancer patients and their families, the Jimmy Fund Clinic follows the family-centered care philosophy of Institute founder, Dr. Sidney Farmer, assuring that a patient's psychological, family, and spiritual needs are met as they receive life-saving medical care. You can get almost anywhere in the Institute from the third floor. From the Jimmy Fund Clinic, cross the Panmas Challenge Bridge to the Knuckle. The Knuckle is where the Dana, Smith, and Yawkey buildings converge. To the left, through the Smith Building, are the bridges to our partners in patient care, Boston Children's Hospital, and Brigham and Women's Hospital, including the Dana-Farber Inpatient Hospital, located on 6B, 6C, and 6D within the BWH Tower. You can also access the Jimmy Fund Building with the Kraft Blood Donor Center and the Boston Red Sox Jimmy Fund Auditorium. On the way behind the elevator bank, is the Office of Postdoc and Graduate Studies. To the right is the Yaki Center for Cancer Care, the Institute's home for adult patient care and clinical research. This state-of-the-art facility was designed with extensive input from patients and their families and contains seven clinical floors divided by specialty, clinical administrative offices, and more. Past the medical records desk, you will find the Yaki Conference Center, including the Cutler Art Gallery, in the Levine Family Dining Pavilion. Along the way, take time to appreciate some of the hidden treasures in the Dana-Farber art collection, and take a few minutes to stop in the Stoneman Healing Garden, where you will find bamboo trees, lush greenery, and bright flowers lining the glass walls. The peaceful garden is a source of tranquility and relaxation for patients and families. On the second floor of the Yaki Center, you will find patient services such as central registration, the pharmacy, lab services, and the chapel. Hidden in the stairwell on Yaki One is a display to commemorate a construction milestone, the signing of the steel beams that support the Yaki building. During the Yaki Center's construction, young Jimmy Fund Clinic patients would post their names at the windows, hoping that an iron worker would immortalize them on a beam. The inscriptions represent the names of patients in treatment, staff members who cared for them, cancer survivors, DFCI benefactors, and all those who live on in the memories of loved ones. Today, these names remain visible to all who enter the center, a reminder to the researchers, clinicians, and the support staff of our shared mission. On the first floor, off the beautiful Yaki Lobby, services include volunteer services, the Blum Resource Center, which provides patients and families with up-to-date, reliable cancer information, and Friends Place, which is a unique shop designed to help patients undergoing treatment to find items such as hats, wigs, and mastectomy recovery items. The Friends Corner gift shop is open to both patients and staff and also has a robust online shop. While you are here, look up 
at the Human Nature Mandel, which includes more than 250 images relating to flora and fauna native to New England. Want to ride a bike or take the tea to work instead of parking? Dana-Farber offers a financial incentive for being green with your transportation and a generous number of bike cages. For staff services such as your badge, tea pass, parking, and security clearances, visit General Services on the lower level of the Shields Warren Building. As you make your way from the Dana Lobby towards the Shields Warren Building, you can't miss the Boston Red Sox Jimmy Fun Gallery a long corridor decorated with baseball paraphernalia. That's the way to the mayor building, which hosts a number of the Institute's laboratories. That's also the way to the Office of Human Resources and Occupational Health Services. Just past the baseball exhibit is the Zakem Center for Integrative Therapies and Healthy Living, where our caregivers integrate the practice of complementary therapies like acupuncture, Reiki, music therapy, meditation, and others into traditional cancer care. If you're hungry, the Longwood Galleria across the way has an extensive food court as well as housing some of our administrative offices. In the immediate neighborhood, our research continues across the street at the Longwood Center, a state-of-the-art research facility at the corner of Longwood and Brookline Avenues, which opened in 2015. In the wet and dry labs and offices in the Center for Life Sciences building at 3 Black Pan Circle, and across the street in the Harvard Institutes of Medicine building. Biomedical research is also being conducted in collaboration with Harvard Medical School in the Sealy Mud building on the HMS Quad. And not far away, near Fenway Park on Burlington Ave, are two additional core research facilities. Those of you in more administrative roles might be joining us in one of our local distributed campuses. 375 Longwood is just across the street and 10 Brookline Place and 20 Overland Street are a short walk or shuttle right away. You can catch the shuttle at the Dana Lobby entrance or in front of the mayor building outside of human resources. The newest extension of our Longwood campus, Dana-Farber Cancer Institute Chestnut Hill, is located in Newton, less than five miles from here. The brand new 140,000 square foot facility features a range of clinical adult outpatient services as well as imaging, pharmacy, nutrition, and genetic services. The site also includes a coffee bar, a gift shop, and meals available all day at the Pan Mass Dining Pavilion. Dana-Farber also partners with providers in local communities in Massachusetts and New Hampshire to provide enhanced cancer care to patients in their own communities. This network allows the Institute to bring knowledge, research, and care to a greater number of patients and combine the strengths of several institutions. If you are joining us today from one of our adult outpatient centers, collaborative or network locations, welcome. We want you to know how happy we are to have you here at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. No matter your role, you're a critical part of our mission. We thank you for choosing to join us and adding to the diverse perspectives, cultures, and identities that drive our breakthrough science and world-class clinical care. We can't wait to witness the impact you'll have on the lives of your colleagues and our patients. Again, welcome to Dana-Farber.好，那个在最后这个丹纳法博的这个视频之后呢，我们今天啊就到了这个尾声了。我们今天呢，实际上介绍了霍华的休斯医学研究所，呃，这个Scripps呃研究所，以及呢冷泉港这个实验室，啊
常春藤的大学，是吧？那根本还没有介绍那些，所以呢，可见这个生物，呃，医药的研究在美国是多么的强大。那好，那我们今天呢，就先介绍。